Hi there. Hello. Good morning. It's wonderful to be here today in front of such an incredible audience. Um, I'm excited to be able to tell some stories about some good news and about recovery and ultimately about transformation. Sadly, in conservation, though, good, good news is often just the absence of bad news. It's true. Um, but as you're hearing today from many of us up here on stage, we're sharing good news that's happening all around us. And there's more than just reason for hope for our wild and uh, wild future. I also just want to share though why being up here is so important to me and for my organization for African Parks and speaking at today's expo. We have been the fortunate and proud beneficiaries of the Elephant Crisis Fund, of the Lion Recovery Fund, of WCN for several years now and have received over 13 grants. They are helping us to protect and monitor elephants. They're helping us bring back lions to places where they have disappeared over decades ago. And they have swept in during some of our darkest hours. One of those events happened actually three years almost to this day in Garamba National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Four of our rangers were gunned down and killed by armed elephant poachers. They ran into them on patrol, there were probably 30 or 40 of them. The helicopter that came in to try to rescue them was also shot at and grounded. When we made that news public, almost immediately, we got a note from Charlie Knowles, who said, how can we help? And we were able to tell him how he could help. And again, within 24 hours, we had a $150,000 grant in our account to be able to help repair the helicopter as well as help charter a helicopter because that's one of our most important tools on the ground, especially in these really difficult areas. There are eyes in the sky. And so it's just a wonderful example of the impact that WCN has on people and groups like ours that are so dependent on nimble and, and important funding that actually is a matter between life and death. So thank you from African Parks, thank you to WCN. What I want to do now is take you to two places where it seemed like all hope was lost, actually almost beyond the crisis. The crisis had happened and it seemed like only scorched earth remained. But in a relatively short period of time, what we were able to do was to recover and transform and ultimately restore these landscapes, not just for wildlife. What we're seeing is that where nature has been allowed to return, there lies a better existence for humans and animals alike. But first, so quickly, the bad news. I'm sure many of you know about what's happening and what we're referring to when we talk about the conservation crisis. Sadly, there's four things that are leading to this. One is the heavy militarized, incentivized criminal networks of poachers that are targeting high-value species. Elephants, rhinos, lions, gorillas. And part, mainly because of the huge demand for the illegal wildlife trade. This is causing entire species declines, not just in Africa, but around the globe. There's the bushmeat crisis, which is also poaching, using wire snares, and more subsistence-based. It's for local people that are just trying to survive and have protein. This is just an image of thousands of wire snares we removed from one of the parks under our management. More wire snares were collected, 30,000 were collected, more than the number of large animals living in that park. There's the habitat loss and fragmentation, which is also a result of human needs, of development, of monocultures, and just the needs of a growing human population. Unlike India and China, where poverty is declining, in many places still in Africa, poverty is increasing and is not going away anytime soon. And the, what we see over and over is that people living in the last of the remaining wild places, some of the most marginalized, some of the most forgotten people on the planet, again, just trying to survive and eke out a living. There are estimated to be around 1,200 formally declared protected areas across Africa. So why the crisis? We've got protected areas. Well, the sad part of that is most of them, if not all, have been poorly managed, if managed at all. And what we're seeing, there's four threats. 
are happening inside and around these protected areas. We know this, that those that are unmanaged now will be lost. And at the rate at which these threats are happening, at best, maybe 100 of these areas that are larger than 100,000 hectares will persist 10 to 20 years from now. What we stand to lose is immense. These last remaining ecologically functioning landscapes that are responsible for clean watershed, for carbon sequestration, and these are systems that are often the last line of defense for the health and security of millions of people. We talk about this being a conservation crisis. It's not. It's a human crisis. But the good news about this being a human crisis, and that it's been man-made, is that we can re-engineer this mess that we've made. We have the solutions for being able to restore these vast landscapes. And if given the chance, we know this, that wildlife can come back and that nature can be restored. And this is why African Parks was formed. So African Parks is a conservation NGO that was founded in the year 2000 in response to the question of why are protected areas failing? And we found that there were really just three main reasons. Lack of skills, lack of will, action, and lack of resources. So our model hits those three things at the core. We enter into long-term management agreements on and ma to manage national parks on behalf of governments. We typically aim for a 25-year management agreement, so we're there for the long haul. The management piece of this, we hire and fire, and we pick and choose the key management unit of those parks, and we source the money. So we come in, we enter into agreements, we try to have three years of sustainable financing from day one, but we are dependent on donors like yourselves, like WCN, in order to adequately finance the long-term management of these areas. And our ultimate goal is to realize the ecological, the economical, and the social value of these protected areas long into the future. Because conservation is a land use choice, it is a choice, it is not a requirement, people must truly benefit from these areas in order to value them and for these protected areas to persist and exist and thrive long into the future. So today we have 15 parks under management in nine countries spanning 10 and a half million hectares. It's the largest amount of area under conservation for any one NGO in Africa. We have roughly 5,000 staff. That's mainly part-time and full-time. Um, the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of them are African nationals. And our goal, is to manage 20 parks by 2020. There are five key pillars to the work that we do that lead towards the long-term sustainability of protected areas. So law enforcement, security is key. Many of these places are lawless, and until you have a good foundation and good law enforcement, only then can everything else start to happen. We do biodiversity conservation or active wildlife management. We're responsible for all the wildlife living in that park. In some cases, we're doing translocations or reintroductions, monitoring. We work on community development, that's building schools, providing teacher salaries, delivering health care. These are critical components that build the long-term support for these parks. Tourism and enterprise, responsible for figuring out uh, financial revenue schemes, whether that's through tourism or other mechanisms, and the management and infrastructure. So the management is having good governance. Each park is registered as a separate legal entity with a board that has government and communities and African Park staff on those boards. And then the infrastructure, it's pretty amazing to what is required to manage some of these landscapes, some that are as large as 40,000 square kilometers, the grading of roads, the building of staff quarters, um, putting in technology, communications. It's, it's a critical foundation, again, for the long-term survival. So what does this all look like when it comes together? So I want to take you to Majeti Wildlife Reserve in Malawi. Majeti sits in the southern part of Malawi, which is one of the smallest, poorest, and most humanly dense countries in all of Africa. That's Majeti. 
So what did this park look like before 2003? Wildlife had been hunted out. Elephants, rhinos, lions, everything had been hunted out in the 90s. Um, the only things that remained were antelope. There were 12 scouts employed. There were zero tourists, because there was nothing to see. Three years leading up to 2003, zero tourists, and therefore zero dollars made its way into the park. It was a forgotten and lonely place with no perceived value at all. Or was it? In 2003, we entered into a long-term management agreement with the Malawian government to fully manage Majeti Wildlife Reserve. The first step was to overhaul law enforcement. Once we could make the park safe, then everything else could follow. In 2003, we reintroduced rhinos. In 2006, elephants followed. In 2012, we brought in lions. And we brought in a whole host of species, buffalo, impala, waterback, even warthogs. Over a six-year period, we reintroduced 2,200 animals from 14 different species. We delivered community projects, we built schools, provided scholarships, built an orphanage, delivered health care, significantly reducing malaria for the first time in years. We invested in people and communities, funding alternative and sustainable livelihoods, micro-enterprises, honey projects, sustainable fisheries, which leads to food security and reduces pressure off of the park's natural resources. Now that the place was safe and wildlife had come back, now tourism could happen. There was a reason to actually come and visit the park. And just fast forward to where we are today in 2018, in 15 years, Majeti has been restored. Those 2,900 animals have grown to over 13,000. From 12 scouts, we now have 180 full-time staff. We had 9,000 tourists come through the door or the entrance of the park last year. 50% of them were Mal Malawian nationals. With them, they brought $500,000, which goes back to the park and to the communities. And an incredible show of support and buy-in from the local communities. Not one elephant, rhino, or lion has been poached since their reintroductions. And the populations have grown so much, those 70 elephants that were reintroduced surpassed 400 last year. And because of the successes that we were able to show the Malawian government with Majeti, in 2015, they invited us to take on the management of three more parks, Lawandi National Park, which is connected to Mangochi, and Nkutakuta Wildlife Reserve. Both of those areas had their own set of problems and challenges. Lawandi was covered in snares. They had lost their lions and all their predators. And Kotakota also had experienced tremendous hunting and had fewer than 100 elephants down from 1,500. But what we were able to do was actually move animals. We actually had a surplus of animals in Majeti. We were able, with the help of the Lion Recovery Fund, be able to move lions into Lawandi National Park and bringing them back into the park for the first time in decades, as well as move elephants into Nkotakota Wildlife Reserve to repopulate and restore that park and increase tourism, and create a conservation-led economy. And I just want to turn to, is that working? I have a short one minute clip just to show that lion translocation.
wonderful example of a successful public-private partnership model and living proof of what can happen with government and donor support, and not just political will, but political action. What we were able to do, again, thanks to our partners, is to help put Malawi on the map as a wildlife destination, as well as shine a light on the Malawian government as an emerging leader in wildlife conservation in Africa. The second place I want to take you to is another unlikely tale of restoration, to Zakuma National Park in Chad, located in the southern part of the country. Zakuma has had a bloody past. Between 2002 to 2010, 4,000 elephants were slaughtered for one thing, for their tusks. They were killed by the Janjaweed men on horseback who came in and took out entire family units all at once. Not only did they wreak havoc on the elephant population, they created a wake of destruction for local people living in around the area. But in 2010, we were invited in by the Chadian government to assume full responsibility and to manage this landscape. And it wasn't for the faint of heart. In our first year there, six rangers were gunned down execution style while delivering their morning prayer before going out on patrol. That never gets easy to say. Um, but we continued, and our rangers continued. And they overhauled law enforcement. They, we built a ranger unit improved coverage of the park through multiple means, using motorcycles, putting rangers on horseback so we could access tougher areas in the park. We were able to bring in communications network and technology. And thanks to the Elephant Crisis Fund, we've been able to collar and monitor elephants in the park so we can better protect them and know where they are, know where they're headed, and know where the threats are to better counter those threats rather than just counting dead elephants. Really key important piece of this was right from day one, we worked with the local communities. We built trust, we went to them, we built airstrips, we provided them with radio networks, we asked them to contact us at any sign of illegal wildlife crime. And the interesting thing was, they didn't just contact us for illegal wildlife crime, they contacted us for all crime. And we showed up over and over <laughs> too. <laughs> We'd fly in and we showed up, which I think was the key thing. We weren't going anywhere. We signed a 20-year agreement. We're there for the long haul. But building trust was essential. And the same thing, we built schools, delivered healthcare. Once the park was safe, we were able to open it up for tourism. This is Camp Nomad. It's a beautiful, beautiful mobile uh, tented camp. It's actually booked out for the next two years. We also have another uh, Camp Salamat, which is open to Chadian nationals, and it's free to them. So they can come and they can see their own natural heritage. And with safety restored, just in May of this year, we were able to bring back the endangered black rhinoceros. It was after 50 years they were last seen in the park, and I was there personally to see that plane land. Rangers lined the runway and saluted their arrival, and thousands of community members showed up to welcome them home. But what about those elephants? Well, poaching had essentially been halted. Remember, 2002 to 2010, 4,000 elephants poached. Between 2010 to 2018, we've lost 24 elephants to poaching. And then elephants could be elephants again. And what did they do? They started to breed, and they could raise their young. And just this year, we counted a record number of elephants. Elephants are on the rise for the first time in decades. They surpassed over 550 individuals. They had reached an all-time low of 450. And this year, we also counted a record number of calves. 129 calves under the age of three years old were counted. In 2011, we counted one. So I have one more, just a two-minute clip, uh, just to wrap this up and to take you into Zakuma National Park.
And today, these wild boar elephants, who no doubt lived through that catastrophic period, they bypass the watering hole and they come to the park manager's house to drink cold water from the hose out of the hands of rangers. And as anthropomorphic as this sounds, we truly believe that not only have these elephants learned to trust, they have forgiven. So in closing, this also is in Zakuma. We look forward to working with the Lion Recovery Fund to understand what's happening with lions in this landscape. There's roughly 120 of them, but there's room and security for there to be so much more. But these two stories of Malawi and Chad are unlikely stories of where it really felt like the crisis had occurred and recovery was so unlikely, and that any opportunity for revival had truly passed us by. But thanks to our government partners, and again to donors like WCN, we're here and able to show that in the wake of conserving and restoring wildlife landscapes lies a better existence for wildlife and people. And where nature is rehabilitated and restored, so too is our own humanity. <laughs>